Hey, this is StarCraft 2 History, and this one is talking about Lenok. And Lenok is, in my opinion, one of the all time. He was pretty close. I think he's basically been knocked out by this point, but he was in my original list of all time great uh, StarCraft 2 players. And if we're just talking about Zerg players, he's still in that uh, mix. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about him because there's a tournament he wins in 2013. It's the last tournament he ever wins, so I thought this is the perfect time to do it. And so let's talk about Lenok. The first time we see Lenok is, like I said, I think GSL Open Season 2, where he six pulls Nada, wins that game, and then he plays out an epic macro game against Nada, at least for the time. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back and watch that one. If you were interested, but that like there are good games Lenok plays later on in his career. You can go back and watch, but that's not one of them. But it was good at the time, and it showed a lot of potential in Lenok as a player and as um and he, so he was quickly picked out as like a prospect that would one day be one of the best Zerg players in the world. And it doesn't it takes him a long time to reach that level, basically a year of development in, uh, in Code. A. And during the Code period, he's kind of known as like the Nesty of Code, so to speak. And Nesty is obviously the Nesty of Codes. And as a player, he had very good mechanics. He was a player who, it's strange, because he has some very big wins. But if you look at the expanse of his career, it's not as strong as you would think, at least I personally thought he could have done better. That's that's the way I'll put it. Because this is a guy who, at the very end of 2011, was the best player in the world by not a deep, large margin, but he was pretty good. He won MLG Providence against all the best players. He beat a number of the best players in GSL November and only lost to Jock G in the finals, and that's obviously a great finals to go back and watch if you're interested. And he also beat MVP in the semifinals. That's also another great series. And during that time, he was either the best or second best Mutaling Baneling player in the world. It depends on how highly you rated Dongwegu. I probably put Dongwegu a, a bit ahead of him, but Lenok was definitely an incredible player. And he also had his own like variations to that because he was one of the earlier adopters of the Infester, but he didn't use it like Stefano would use it. He used, he'd use it in more of like a desperation gamble sometimes. Like that's how... He had to, that's why he used it to kind of close out MVP in that crazy comeback game. MVP almost made happen in the semifinals of GSL November 2011. And Lenok also had this great ability for counterattacks, not to extent of life, but he had it in him. And he was all, and the difference between him and life, one of them was he loved using Bailing Landmines the most. I'd say he was the most obsessed with them among all the different players to the point where. Like in 2013, 2014, he would, by that point, like everybody had understood how important creep tumors were. But instead of allocating his APM towards spreading creep, he allocated it towards setting up banning landmines in counterattack situations. So that's kind of, that was kind of like uh, Leonok's favorite thing to do. As for his 2012 period, this is when he was like his, his most disgusting, basically. This is the point where he adopts the Brutal Infester. He's one of the best Brutal Infester players. Not the best, but one of the best. And he was a little bit different from the others. So I usually don't like to talk about this period, but I will in this case. So what made Lenok different from the others is he abused it in a different way. And what I mean by that is he used the fear of the Infester to let him do a bunch of really cheesy shit all the time. So he pulled out a shitload of crazy fucking all-ins all the time. And then he could also play standard. Or he could transition all the cheesy all-in shit if they if it does if it didn't work out into a standard infester game anyway. Or sometimes he would do like Mutaling Baneling with like double spire and then transfer over to Infestor Bane uh Infestor Brutalord if that didn't work. So this guy like basically his entire skill set like the linchpin was the Infested Brutalord, but he because it was so strong, it allowed him to do whatever the fuck he wanted for a long period of time. And he's also an important player to talk about if you're talking about life, because he is life's first great rival in um, StarCraft II, in my opinion. 
because the two of them play a m- multiple times. They actually trade a bunch of sets, but life gets like the bigger ones. Like life wins fall the fall championship, and but like Lee Doc knocks him out in like a in one of the GSLs. I forget which one of them was like in a group stage, and so and the two of them always have like really epic sort of ZVZ matches just because they're both so micro intensive that they usually end up in. Zerg Baneling War, Zergling Baneling Wars, which are basically dead by this point. So if you've never seen them, I'd recommend going back and watching Effort versus Dongwei Gu because then you'd understand how dangerous and how exciting those matchups could be. Just because it requires so much micro and attention that if you fuck up on either side of the equation, so if you fuck up on the micro, you could trade 20 Zerglings for one Baneling. But if you fa- fuck up on the ma- macro, you could be permanently behind by four larvae, and that's like eight zerglings or eight addition. Uh, that's like eight zer- extra zerglings or eight additional banelings, depending on the money, right? So that's that, it was a very dangerous and very interesting sort of uh, game that a game that developed, and it, it slowly gets phased out as uh, it actually gets phased out because of Protoss, and this is a. I guess this is a side tangent, but basically people figured out that Protoss couldn't function unless they had smaller, narrower uh, choke points. And this actually makes ZVZ less interesting because Zergs figured out, oh, I don't have to play these Zergling Bailing Wars. I just have to figure out how to wall in with a bunch of queens, an Evo Chamber, and a Roach Warren or something like that. So, yeah, that's kind of just how it goes. As for as for Leenok... One of the reasons I had him so highly touted was very similar to SOS was this is a player who had huge, um, two huge wins, probably the, two of the biggest tournament wins of all time. IPL 5, which was, in my opinion, probably the hardest, if you're just hardest tournament to win, if you're just talking about the number of good players there. Obviously, um, there's the context of Broodlord and Fester being in his favor, but there's also a bunch of Zerg players, so... Certainly, to an extent, it helped him, but as to how far the extent was, that's uh, that's a point of discussion. And there's also MLG Providence, which I had touched on earlier. And then he basically dies off in uh, Heart of the Swarm. And the reason Leenog dies off in terms of play in Heart of the Swarm is because he's too obsessed with his old styles. Like he in the only tournament he wins is, like I said, Stockholm, and that's very early. That's earlier on in Heart of the Swarm. And it's against players that don't necessarily understand how how to punish him. Like Hero, like Hero, like if is an incredibly stylistic player, so he's not really playing playing the uh, Protoss styles that are going to force him to play. Naniwa, I think I don't think he was really up to date. Uh, actually, wait, it might be in the wrong timeline. Yeah, I think it's in the wrong timeline. Basically, both Hero and Naniwa, like were playing were playing Leenok before Protoss like had figured out what to do against Zerg in Heart of the Swarm, basically. So, like, the, the by the time, like, Zer, uh, Protoss figures out what to do in Heart of the Swarm, it's like, we're going to, like, Season 2 or Season 3 of the WCS seasons back then. So, it was like, I think it was Rain that really understood, and then later on, it would be Z- uh, Deer. And then, obviously, in 2014, you get into, like, Zest. So, neither of them really understood what how to beat what Leenok was throwing out at them, which is, like, Zergling, Ultra... Was it was was he still using a fester? He might have been. It, it's been a while, but basically he's using that kind of stuff, and you basically that gets crushed. And then on top of that, Leenok was a huge met, uh, metalisk user. It's sometimes even uh, and in uh, ZVP too. So that gets crushed because Phoenixes have extra range to kill the metalisk. And then because the infester no longer exists, all of his early game shenanigans get crushed. So that's out. So basically what happens is from heart of, from Wings of Liberty to Heart of the Swarm, he has to either reinvent his game or die. And then he ba- basically dies because he never reinvents his game. He kind of sticks to his old styles. And it's good for like some upset wins, but it was never a consistent way to win. And so that's basically Leenok in a nutshell from for the rest of the time. And you can even see this today in Legacy of the Void. Like he's not using the best... Uh, compositions or he's not using the best units he's just playing a style he likes to play and fuck everybody else I guess that's kind of what Leenok was about and Leenok was um, he's, he's he's less for, he's less forgotten now because he's been so mediocre for so many years but he was at one point one of the best drugs in the world and and 
an important uh, player to look at. Definitely a very fun player too, even though he ha- even though like a large portion of his career was in the Brood Lord and Fester era. So, all right, I think that covers it for Lenok. I'll see you guys later.